Gregor Malfoy and the year when everyone suddenly paid attention to him. Frederick will hear about this. Chapter 10. Worth the wait. Harry finally had his next lesson with Dumbledore the Monday after the victory against Hufflepuff. It gave him the opportunity to hand over Slugshorn's memory at long last, something that he had been prevented from doing due to Dumbledore's long absence in the last couple of weeks. He told Draco all about their new insights the next morning after he had adopted him from the breakfast table to take him out to the lakeside. The weather was sunny but still fresh, and Draco was pressed up tightly against Harry's side to steal some of his warmth as Harry repeated what Slughorn had replied to young Tom Riddle's question. So, seven Horcruxes? Draco asked, feeling both faint and sick. That's what Dumbledore thinks. Harry nodded, tracing calming circles across Draco's back. Dumbledore already destroyed the ring, and I destroyed one in second year. The diary. The diary? Draco repeated, definitely feeling sick now. Oh god, I was possessed by a Horcrux! Well, yes, Harry admitted, making a face. But does it change anything, really? It feels more crass, Draco moaned, closing his eyes. I'd take a memory over an actual piece of his bloody soul! Well, it makes no difference to me, Harry said pointedly, kissing Draco's cheek. You're you. He's gone now. Draco took a deep, steadying breath and nodded. You're right, he agreed. No use getting worked up over it now. There was a beat of silence in which they just leaned against each other, Harry's forehead touching against Draco's temple before Draco asked, So do you have any idea what the other Horcruxes might be? Yes, Harry admitted. Dumbledore showed me another memory. Voldemort was working for Morgan and Burks after his graduation, and he sort of used the job as an opportunity to scout for valuable objects. He might use his horcruxes. An old witch called Hepzibah Smith showed him a locket that once belonged to Salazar Slytherin, and a cup that used to belong to Helga Hufflepuff. The locket was one that Voldemort's mother sold after her husband had left her when the spell had been broken. He stole both objects from her and murdered her, made it look like the hell's elf did it, quit the job, and disappeared. Dumbledore thinks both became more corpses. All right, Draco frowned. I get the locket, since he's a descendant of Slytherins. But why the cup? Because Voldemort feels more attached to Hogwarts than he ever felt to any person. Harry explains very quietly. It's the one place he ever felt like he belonged. Dumbledore thinks he would have tried to collect heirlooms from each founder. But to his knowledge, the only heirloom of Gryffindors is the sword, and that is out. So there was the cup and maybe something of Ravenclaw's if he managed to find something. I see, Draco nodded. So that makes the locket, the cup, the ring, the diary, something of Ravenclaw's. That's five. Dumbledore thinks his snake Nagini might be the sixth Horcrux, Harry told him. The seventh part would be the one left in his body. Oh, Draco muttered, gulping. So the two of those are taken care of. That leaves three objects to find and destroy, one snake to kill, and then Voldemort can be harmed? Yes. Harry nodded. That's what it looks like. Blimey! Draco sighed. He doesn't make it easy. But at least it's a plan of some sort. Harry tried. It's better than nothing. And because Harry was looking at him with so much hope, Draco couldn't help but agree, though his mind was already pointing out all the weaknesses in said plan. How did you even destroy a Horcrux? They better research. He knew Hermione had had no luck finding books on Horcruxes, but maybe he could summon the books from the manor library or something. Also, how to find the missing Horcruxes? Maybe Dumbledore had some insights he was going to share with Harry on that front. As if Harry could hear the wheels in his head turning, he told him, That's what Dumbledore's doing when he leaves the school. He's looking for Horcruxes. Well, good, Draco muttered. Has he been lucky since the ring? He said he's close to finding another one, Harry said, and that he'll take me along when the time comes. Draco didn't know how to feel about that. On one hand, it was good to know that Dumbledore was involving Harry as much as he could, for he'd had a way of keeping important information from him in the past. On the other hand, taking him along on such a mission was a stark reminder of Harry's leading role in the upcoming war, something that Draco wasn't yet entirely comfortable with. Then again, if Dumbledore was with him, at least he should be well protected. Don't worry. Harry told him, again reading Draco's silence correctly. He carded gentle fingers through Draco's hair, making the Slytherin shiver. It's going to be fine. I hope you're right, Draco sighed, leaning in to steal a quick kiss. 
I'll never forgive Dumbledore if you get hurt. A week later, the sixth years had an apparition practice session scheduled at Hogsmeade. The problem was that Harry and Draco were the only students who would not be of age at the time of the testing after the Easter holidays, and therefore they were left behind. The two of them did not mind exactly. Arithmancy and ancient ruins were cancelled due to Draco being the only student present, and transfiguration in the morning had been such a disaster with Harry completely unfocused and distracting Draco that an exasperated McGonagall sent them out early, though admittedly with a lot of homework. That gave Harry the whole afternoon to herbology to further distract Draco from anything productive, a task to which he promptly set out by pushing Draco against the wall of an abandoned corridor on the way to the library, for instance. You're a nuisance, Draco muttered weakly against Harry's lips, but the complaint was undermined by the way he knotted his fingers in Harry's mop of air. If my grades drop because of you, shut up. Harry moaned, promptly shoving his tongue into Draco's mouth to keep it busy. And well, that wasn't playing fair, really. Draco didn't know how long they stood there, just kissing feverishly, until the sound of footsteps on the stone floor broke them apart. Draco pushed at Harry's chest to keep him from diving for Draco's lips again. Harry's lack of public decency was sometimes appalling. Throwing a quick look over Harry's shoulder, stunned to recognize a familiar face. Dora! He asked, making Harry freeze. What are you doing here? Dora, too, stopped in her movements to blink at them, apparently only now taking notice of their presence. Harry awkwardly shoved off Draco's expression. Sheepish. The Draco didn't think Dora had even processed that she had caught them in the middle of anything untoward. She looked horrible, to be frank. Her hair was a dull, mousy gray that should belong to someone at least three times her age, and there were dark shadows under her red-rimmed eyes. Are you okay? Draco asked softly, taking a step towards her. Yes, Dora nodded, trying to smile, but it came out as a grimace. I came to see Dumbledore. His office is not here, Harry frowned. It's around the other side of the castle, behind the gargoyle. I know, Dora interrupted him. He's not here. Apparently, he's gone away again. Oh, Harry just said, trailing off. What did you want to see him about? Nothing in particular, Dora shrugged, but she looked shifty, restless and the untruthfulness of her words was belied by her next words. I just thought he might know what's going on. I've heard rumors. People getting hurt. She looked at Draco imploringly. Have you heard from... No, Draco replied gently, shaking his head. I'm afraid I haven't. Neither of us have. Oh, she muttered, and there were tears in her eyes. Draco reached out to touch her hand, squeezing it. He's going to be fine, he told her. You know we can't always get in touch. But he's resilient and careful. He's going to be just fine. Dora nodded, giving him a watery smile that didn't reach her eyes. Right then, she muttered. I need to go. See you around, you two. See you, Draco said softly, but Harry just stared after her, seeming dumbfounded. What was that? Harry asked him after she was gone. Who was she talking about? Draco hesitated. He didn't want to break Dora's confidence, but Harry was his boyfriend, and they didn't really do secrets, did they? She was asking about Lupin, Draco admitted, leaning back against the wall and watching his eyes widen at the new information. Please don't tell anyone I'm not supposed to say. Are the two of them? Harry asked, blinking. No, Draco sighed. It's complicated. She's been really hung up over it. I thought she's been depressed because of Sirius, Harry muttered. Yeah, well, Draco shrugged. So did I initially, but it's Lupin, apparently. Why hell, Harry said, leaning back against the wall as well, so close that their shoulders touched. Poor thing, she looks awful. Draco hummed, trying to put himself into his cousin's shoes. How would he be able to deal with it, knowing that Harry cared for him to a certain degree, but refusing to act on it because he was hell-bent on protecting him? Being forced instead to watch from afar as Harry threw himself into danger, not knowing if he was alive or dead. Draco reached out to entwine their fingers, glad that Harry was there with him, that he actually got to have this. Harry squeezed his hand, as if sensing Draco's mood, and turned his head to press a lingering kiss to his cheekbone. The Easter holidays started that same weekend, giving the sixth gears the opportunity to work down their mountains of homework and start on exam revision. 
For Harry, though, holidays seemed to translate to long days ahead with nothing to do but molesting my boyfriends, which Draco found in equal parts delightful and alarming. It's like you have no self-control, mate. Weasley complained on what's such occasion as Harry was hanging all over Draco, who was making a violent attempt at writing his essay for a seat. Weasley had slowly integrated himself back into their group after his breakup, much to Draco's consternation. He was trying his best to keep his insults at bay for the sake of Harry, who seemed to welcome the reconciliation of their friend group, and even for Hermione, who seemed to have forgiven Weasley, for the most part. Draco was unsure how that had happened, but Harry had told him there had been a shouting match in the Gryffindor common room and some heart-to-heart -heart that had resulted in them rekindling their former friendship. Fuck Draco if he knew what that meant, but then again, maybe he wasn't one to judge. After all, he had gone through quite some drama while pining for Harry, too. Consequently, Draco remained the only one angry at Weasley once again, though, meaning he had to hold his tongue and play nice Slytherin to the dumb meme Gryffindor. Thank God for Jenny, who had no reserve for saying what Draco was thinking. That's rich coming from you. Uh, that's rich coming from you. Jenny snorted, looking up from her owl vision. I distinctly remember you constantly having your tongue down Lab Lab's throat for about half a year. At least Harry and Draco have some decency. They keep the tongue acrobatics for when we aren't around. Draco grinned, and Jenny held up a hand for Draco to high-five, which Draco gratefully accepted. Don't worry, she smirked. I am your back. You two was so annoying since you've become friends. Weasley commented, rolling his eyes. Suck it up, Weasley. Draco rolled his eyes. Be happy I'm not shagging her. I was under the impression that was your biggest worry. Weasley almost joked on air, and Jenny cackled. Harry was chuckling into Draco's ear, making him shiver. Well, I, for one, am quite grateful you aren't. He pointed out, I might have had to murder Jenny. You could have tried. Jenny grinned. Please, snap out as I have a shagging, Draco. Hermione said absentmindedly as she scribbled down an elusive rune. It would make an awful gravestone inscription. Wow! Ryan noted, grinning as he appeared behind Jenny, a hand on her shoulder. Draco, you really did a number on your Gryffindor friends. You made them fluent as sass. I am impressed. Excuse me? Jenny said indignantly. I've always been fluent at sass. Sass is my middle name. Have you met my brothers? Present company excluded, of course. Oi! Weasley called, looking offended. Oh, do shut up! Jenny rolled her eyes as she packed up her things and got to her feet. She kissed Ryan's cheek as she did, making Draco bite his lip to keep from grinning. Wow, well, wow. Well. I'm off to the library, she announced, waving at them. See you later! And with that, they were gone, leaving her brother to gape after them. Well, that? He started turning to them. Did she just... He turned on Draco, his gaze at Kira's authority. That was a Slytherin! Oh, really? Draco bad. Your powers of deduction humble me, Weasley. Since when did my sister dating a Slytherin? For about a week now, Hermione shrugged. Though they've been dancing around it for a while now. What the blood it out? Weasley called. What? Draco demanded rather sharply. Are you going to tell me you're discriminating against him because he's a Slytherin? There was a moment of silence in which Weasley seemed to have realized what he had said. He looked to Harry, who had raised an eyebrow at him, his arms still around Rago, and his face, for once, unsympathetic. He then turned to Hermione, whose expression was decidedly unimpressed, and it made him sort of grumble. It would have been funny if Drago wasn't so incest. Well, no, Weasley said at last, his voice small. Good, Drago returned, rather pointedly. Because he's my beater, and he's a good bloke. Ginny couldn't have found anyone better. Weasley's ears were rather red now, but he let the subject drop, much to Draco's surprise. Harry brought a hand up to Draco's neck and gently pressed his fingers into the knots of tension that had built in rhythmic circles, making them loosen. With a sigh, Draco returned to his essay. Harry kissed the spot behind his ear that made him all fluttery, and he even forgot to be angry. You know... Draco moaned, leaning back in Harry's arms as the other sucked on the junction of his neck and his shoulder. You really need to let me study once in a while. I let you study all the time. Harry protested, tightening his arms around him. It's not my fault you study like Hermione. I don't, Draco said rather weakly. I just have a bigger workload than you. I... 
but the rest of his sentence was swallowed up in a kiss, and Rigor dropped the book onto the grass before them and let Harry pull him into a horizontal position. It was curiously warm out today, the first feelers of spring reaching the Scottish mountains, and Harry and Draco had escaped their group of friends for some alone time outside on the grounds. Draco had taken his work along, but he should have known that he wouldn't get anything done once they were unchaperoned. And it's not like he minded, really. He might gripe at Harry, but he could still study in the evenings up at his dormitory. This time with Harry was too precious to turn him down. So we twisted in Harry's arms until they were chest to chest and he was able to kiss Harry properly. Harry's arms closed around Draco, pulling their bodies closer together, and Draco just let himself sink into it, enjoying Harry's proximity and touch. He could never get enough of it, and from the looks of it, neither could Harry. As if to prove that Harry's mind had traveled along the same tracks, Harry muttered, quite without breaking the kiss, so the words were muffled against Draco's lips. Merlin, we're not alone enough. You're driving me mad. We're alone all the time, Draco chuckled, breaking the kiss to smile at him. Not really. Harry groaned. There's always people around, and we're always in public. The closest we get to privacy is snogging behind a tapestry. Yeah, well, Draco grimaced. That's the downside to not being in the same house. We can't just sneak into a dormitory while our roommates are out or something. I'm so close to just hiding you under the invisibility cloak and smuggling you into Gryffindor for a night. Harry said darkly, making Draco laugh. I don't think Weasley would appreciate it. Draco smirked, though that would make me even more up for it, to be honest. Harry pitched him for that, making Draco squirm on top of him, laughing some more. No, really, Harry said, and he looked a little shy now. I was thinking maybe at some point we could use the room of requirement, you know, like we used to for occlumency lessons. Draco blinked, wondering why that hadn't occurred to him before. Oh, he said. Sure, of course. That sounds like the easiest way to find privacy in this bloody castle. Yeah. Harry nodded, one hand drawing circles on Draco's back. I mean, it doesn't have to be immediately. We could take our time. It's just... I really want to touch you. Draco flushed as Harry's meaning sank in, and he cleared his throat, fixing his boyfriend with a look. Harry, he said, I don't need time. I've had enough time, believe me. I've known for a while that I want to touch you. Oh, Harry nodded, looking both embarrassed and pleased. Good. He leaned up to press his lips against Draco's for a soft kiss, and Draco cupped his cheeks with both hands, making it last. Speaking of it, Harry continued, slightly breathless when they pulled apart again. When exactly did you fall for me? I always wondered. Draco halted. Scanning Harry's face. When did you? He asked, hesitant to give his game away just yet. No, that's not fair. Harry complained. I asked first. Humor me. Draco smiled, running nimble fingers through Harry's messy hair. Uh, Harry rolled his eyes. Fine, I started figuring it out after Ginny made that stupid comment on the Hogwarts Express last year, if you must know. Uh, Draco smiled. Spent the summer thinking about it then. You have no idea. Draco huffed, and then I came back with this whole new awareness of you, and I got jealous all over the place, and my amorthentia smelled of you. He cut himself off, his eyes widening, indicating that he had not meant to say that. Draco, though, was gleaming under that new knowledge. Tell me more! Tell me more! He cooed. No, enough. Harry is obviously embarrassed. Your turn. When did you fall for me? Draco sighed, a little more guarded now. He looked Harry in the eye. What do you think? He asked. No! Harry called indignantly, glaring at him. I answered. You can't weasel out now. It's just a question, Harry. Draco chuckled. It's not like I'm not going to answer. I'm just curious about how aware you are. But I'm pants at this kind of thing, and you know it. Harry grumbled. There's no way I'll get it right. Just try. Draco shrugged. What do you have to lose? Well, you might tease me forever, for one. Harry rolled his eyes. But fine, whatever. Did you realize around the time when I asked you to Slughorn's Christmas party? Draco gave him a pitying look. After? Harry asked, biting his lip. Before! Draco called incredulous. Salazar, honestly? 
Marlin, okay, okay. Maybe Ginny's comment did it for you too? You're not even trying! Draco complained and Harry rolled his eyes. Fine. Harry groaned, closing his eyes. Just let me think. He was silent for a moment, his face scrunched up, and Draco got an open smile. How about when I didn't show? Harry asked, opening his eyes again. No, Draco said, but you're getting warmer. Come off it, Draco. Harry went. I'm never going to guess. Just tell me. Draco chuckled, shaking his head. There was a moment of silence between them, and it was what Draco needed to gather the courage to speak the words out loud. Yule Ball, fourth year, he admitted, his voice soft. Harry gaped, his mouth falling open. The silence stretched on between them. Draco, Harry said, his voice flat. That's more than two years now. Yeah, Draco muttered, shrugging. Well, silence again before Harry is out a very heartfelt fuck. Draco found himself on his back on the grass a moment later, and Harry was all over him, kissing him like he wanted to make up for all the time he hadn't spent kissing him in the past. Draco clung onto his shoulders helplessly, whimpering into the kiss and trying not to drown. I'm sorry, Harry breathed when he finally pulled away to look at him, green eyes full of pain and guilt. I'm so sorry, Draco, I had no idea. All this time? God, I'm so thick. No, you're not, Draco said softly. I was hiding it from you with all my might, after all. Still, I should have noticed. Harry moaned, resting his forehead against Draco's. Our fight fourth year, the leak. Draco grimaced and Harry's grip on it tightened. I never wanted to hurt you, Draco. I know you didn't, Draco whispered. It's okay, I don't blame you. I blame me, Harry hissed, because I think I might have been feeling this back then. I just didn't recognize it. You've always been special, Draco, and I could never put my finger on it. I think part of it was that I didn't think I was supposed to feel this way for a bloke. Growing up with the Dursleys, you don't really think that's an option until someone tells you it is. But it's also that the feeling has always just been there, and I never really questioned it. I knew what I felt for you was different than what I felt for Ron or Hermione, but I'd accepted that because that's just how we were, but damn! He leaned in to press his lips to Draco's again. If I had known that you were suffering because of me, I don't know, maybe I'd have figured it out sooner. But that wouldn't have worked for me, I think, Draco frowned, because I'd have always wondered if you were with me because you felt guilty or because you wanted to be with me. So really, this is better. And Harry... He cupped Harry's neck, catching those startling green eyes to make sure he was listening. You were worth the wait. I would have waited way longer for you. Harry made a pained noise in his throat and kissed him again, pouring all the things he didn't seem able to voice out loud into the kiss. And Draco let himself fall into it, let Harry take care of him. And honestly, these years of finding, of feeling lost and not good enough, they had been hard, but this? Harry's arms around him and their lips against each other's. Draco would do it all over again for this outcome. And Draco would tell Harry that, again and again, until the others stopped feeling guilty. When Draco returned to his dormitory that evening, he felt completely blissed out, and he knew that a smile was permanently fixed on his face. This made it come as even more of a shock to find Zabini sitting on Draco's bed in the otherwise empty room, a sour look on his face. Draco halted in the doorway, staring at Zabini with wide eyes, and the other raised his dark, unamused eyes to his with a click of his tongue. Finally, he snapped. Come in and close the door behind you. I need to talk to you, you prat. Me? Draco asked, hesitantly stepping fully into the dormitory and letting the door fall shut with a soft click. Why would you want to talk to me? Because while you have been busy snogging Potter's face off, Zabini began, rolling his eyes to express what he thought of that particular life choice, things around here are actually going to shit, and I figured it was time someone made you aware of that. What in Salazar's name are you talking about? Draco demanded. Not, Zabini called. Haven't you noticed anything unusual about his behavior? Draco frowned, staring at him. Well, he muttered, he's been quiet. Subdued, really. But with his father in Azkaban, I thought... He's up to something, Malfoy. 
Savini interrupted him. Something is going on in the background, and he's trying not to draw any attention to himself. That's why he's quiet. Draco was more alert now. What do you mean he's up to something? Draco asked. What is he doing? I don't know. Sabini got clearly frustrated. Something sinister, for sure. I bet my left arse cheek that he's in league with the Death Eaters. Draco drew in a gasp. He felt cold all over. They wouldn't... He's a kid! Draco stammered. He's barely of age! You think the Dark Lord cares about that? Zabini scoffed. Because I don't. It might be the perfect way to punish his father for failing him. And Draco knew that he was right. Crap! He muttered, running a shaky hand through his hair. You have to talk to him. Zabini said. Me? Draco called. Why me? Because you're on Potter's side, you idiot. You managed to jump off. You can help him do it. I'm sorry to burst your little bubble. Draco cut in, feeling a little hysterical. But the Andor not hates me. He'd rather die than accept my help. He doesn't hate you. He's jealous of you, you billock. Zabini groaned. He's always wanted to be you, at least when you were younger, and then you threw away all that privilege and turned against him, and he never really got over that. But I know he doesn't want to be doing any of this. How can you be so sure? Draco challenged. He seems pretty convinced of his Death Eater ideals to me. Have you looked at him recently, Malfoy? Zabini groaned. He's a walking corpse. He's scared and desperate. He needs someone to help him. And I thought that's what you and your savior friends did, helping people. Draco cursed. This is a horrible idea, he muttered. He's going to murder me if I try talking to him. You won't know until you try. Zabini shrugged. I told you, Malfoy, your role in this war is bigger than being Potter's damn sidekick. It's time you acted like it. Plus, you owe Pansy for saving your bloody neck from Umbridge last year, and this is us calling him favors. Draco took a deep breath. Flashes of memory hit him of when Theodore not and he were still children and playing in the manor gardens. With a deep sigh, he nodded. Fine, he gave in. I'll try. I'll figure something out. Thanks, Salazar. Zabini breathed. Draco turned his head and looked over at Knott's empty bed, wondering what in Merlin's name he had just gotten himself into.